Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to have Dr. Joseph Pozzorno here today with us um, for a special webinar on how to leverage environmental medicine in your practice. Um, my name is Kaylee. I'm uh, with the Fullscript marketing team. And if you're just joining us for the first time, if you're not fully sure or you're new to Fullscript, Fullscript is a free supplement dispensing platform and treatment insurance tool that supports practitioners, whether they choose virtual dispensing, in office sales, group care, whatever your mix fits your workflow. So we're there for you at all points. Um, before we get into the presentation with Dr. Pizzorno, a little housekeeping. This is being recorded, so all registrants will get a copy of the recording, as well as you might have noticed in your control panel, you have a few handouts, um, as well as a guide, an introduction to environmental medicine in the chat. So all of those will be included in a follow-up as well. So um, if you have to drop early or you, can't, you don't have access to them, um, you'll get them at a later time. So I do know that most of you um, probably know Dr. Pizzorno, but he is a naturopathic physician, educator, and researcher with over 50 years of experience in integrative medicine. His mission has been to ensure practitioners have a safe, effective, and high quality natural medicines for their patients. He is a member of uh, Full Scripts and Medical Advisory Board, the editor-in-chief of PubMed Index IMCJ, a founding board member and current chair of IFM, and the founding president, the founding president of Bastyr University, and founding board member of American Herbal Pharmacopoeia. He is a member of the science boards of Hecht Foundation, Gateway for Cancer Research, and Bioclinic Naturals. Um, uh, one of my favorite points is that you were appointed by Presidents Clinton and Bush to two prestigious government commissions to advise President and Congress on how to integrate, integrate natural medicine into the healthcare system, which is amazing. I could go on and on and on. And as I said, most of you probably already know um, all about Joseph Pizzorno. So I won't take up any more time and I will pass it over to you. Um, and I will join you hopefully at the end for a live Q&A. So one last thing, add your questions to the dashboard there and we'll try to get to that at the end with Dr. Pizzorno. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph, for being with us today and I will pass it over to you. Great. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you everybody for attending this webinar. So I've been involved in medicine now for literally over half a century. <clears throat> so over this period of time, I've had a chance to see well, what works and what doesn't work and read a lot of research. And frankly, I've come to a somewhat different perspective on what makes people sick and how to make them healthy than where I was at when I started here half a century ago. Something I've noticed is that while nutritional deficiencies and excesses certainly contribute a lot to disease, the body is able to adapt to a lot of that. Not perfectly, but it is able to adapt and limit the amount of disease that that causes. But when we get to environmental toxins, many times we're being exposed to new to nature molecules that we actually can't detoxify very well, or we're being exposed to heavy metals that were kind of protected, you know, deep into the ground, so we weren't exposed to them either. So, as what I've seen with the research is that as our body load of chemicals and metals has increased, so has the incidence of disease. And so it appears that we're less able to protect ourselves from these environmental toxins than we are able to adapt to nutrient deficiencies. Now, I want to be very clear, nutrient deficiencies are a big issue, but we've actually overwhelmed them with an even worse problem. So our environment is now so toxic that I am traveling literally all over the world, you know, except for COVID this last year, but about 100,000 miles a year, lecturing to doctors all over the world that environmental to toxins have become the primary drivers of disease. So now that can be pretty overwhelming. So what I've come to realize is that rather than talk about all these huge problems being caused by environmental toxins, let's instead focus on the worst of the toxins and provide some skills for high diagnosis in your patients and what you do about it. And I want to be very clear. I'm not expecting people to be environmental medicine experts after doing this one hour course. But I would like to say I'm in the process now of developing some pretty comprehensive educational programs that will provide a pathway for those who want to become skilled in environmental medicine. The good news is that there's a lot we can do. The bad news is we need to do a lot because it's, it's causing most of the disease these days. 
So, um, overview. We're suffering now a worldwide epidemic of chronic disease. We have the highest burden of chronic disease ever in human history, and it's in every age group. While medical apologists will say, well, people get older, therefore they have more chronic disease. While that's true, people don't have to have disease when they get older. And I realize I may have a skewed perspective, but I got I got to know my great grandfather and many of my my progenitors, both male and female. They all got really old. They have virtually no disease because they lived healthy lifestyles. But as people develop less and less healthy lifestyle, as the environment has become more polluted, as our food supplies become depleted of needed nutrients, not just the vitamins and minerals, but so many other molecules are important from food that we have lost because of modern agriculture. So it turns out that we have all this disease in all these age groups because we fill people with toxins and we remove the nutrients they need to protect themselves. So I'll be talking about what are the causes, and I'll use diabetes as an example. I think you'll see by the time we're done with this talk, with this lecture, that toxins are the primary causes of chronic disease now in every age group. Medical apologists say, say, as I said before, people get more chronic disease as they get older. That's true. But everybody's getting chronic disease, not just old people. So we're going to talk about what diseases are being caused by the worst of the toxins, where they come from, how you assess them, and how you get rid of them. Obviously, we could be talking for a lot more than an hour, but I think you'll find this pretty interesting. A point I want to make that's really, really important. This is human clinical data. We're not talking about cell cultures, we're not talking about theory, we're not talking about animal cultures. Virtually every slide I'm going to show you is human data. So as I've gone around the world lecturing on environmental medicine, I look at what toxins are richest in that particular um, country. And it turns out that while there are some variants between countries in terms of which are the highest, all industrialized countries have elevated levels of toxins. There's no question. Some are just higher in some countries than in other countries. So we start looking at the worldwide epidemic of chronic disease. We look at the percent of children with ADHD, a condition that wasn't even known when I started practice 50 years ago, and now is affecting around 10% of the population of kids. It's terrible. And how about kidney failure this epidemic? Everywhere, people's kidneys are failing. But how about diabetes? I'm going to talk more about diabetes as an example, simply because we have way more research. So when I was in Nashville Medical School, way back over here, diabetes affected about 1% of the population. Now it's affecting 10% of the population, and we are now projecting, research is now projecting, that within a person's lifetime, one out of three people will get diabetes. Why? Well, of course, we as natural medicine practitioners think, well, it must be due to sugar. Sugar is bad for us. And it's true, sugar is bad for us. If you look at the sugar consumption, as you can see, we got to a fairly high level, and then we kind of plateaued off. But the deep diabetes epidemic started way after we started consuming too much sugar. So if sugar consumption was the cause of diabetes, why don't we see a, a, a clear correlation? Because you look at the diabetes epidemic started way over a year. Okay, so something else. How about obesity? No question about it. People who are obese have dramatically more diabetes. Matter of fact, look at people who are morbidly obese. Most likely they already have diabetes, this hasn't been diagnosed. But here's the key factor. Oh, and by the way, this obesity thing, one of the worst risk factors for getting COVID-19 and getting severe versions of COVID-19 and dying, dying from it, one of the best predictors is obesity. Now, before we say obesity is the cause of diabetes, you gotta look at this study. If people who are obese do not have a high body load of environmental toxins, they have no increased incidence of diabetes. So here's a study, it's come out of, of research by Nia Ducky Lee in uh, South Korea. Uh, who first identified this about 15 years ago and has now been reproduced by many others. So this diagram, I think, makes the case very, very compellingly. The vertical axis is our prevalence of diabetes. So we're not talking about the risk. We're talking about people already have diabetes. Across the horizontal axis, we have body weight. Across the z-axis, we have body load of diabetogens. Researchers are finding these chemicals are so good promoting diabetes, they're calling them diabetogens, 
by the way, they also call them obesogens, okay? So looking at just six of the worst diabetic gens, uh, we're calling them, they're, they're called persistent organic pollutants, or POPs for short. As you can see, as body load of toxins goes up, and as body weight goes up, the prevalence of diabetes goes up. And you look at this, obese people in the top 20% of body load of these toxins, 60% already have diabetes. My little cure, look at obese people, low levels by load, environmental toxins, yes, what? No increased incidence of diabetes. Now, how about a lean person? We don't expect lean people to get diabetes, but they're getting it. Lean person, top 20% by load of environmental diabetogens, almost 30% of them already have diabetes. So I hope you get the, get the message here. I'm not saying obesity is good for people, but it's how they got obese and what's in their fat that is actually the big problem. Okay, going further. So we have significant daily exposure. Now, if you look at this vertical axis, you might say, well, it's only um, micrograms per day. I'm sorry, there's nanograms. It's only nanograms per day. That doesn't sound like very much. But when those toxins have very, very long half life remember, these are new to nature molecules. Many of these molecules were designed to be difficult to break down by biological systems. That's why they're called persistent organic pollutants. Once again, in the environment, they're there for a long time. Once again, to our bodies, they're in our bodies for a long time as well. So looking at DDT, for example, you might say, well, yeah, but we, we banned DDT 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago now. Great. But the problem is it's a persistent pollutant. So not only is it still in the environment, even though it's not being added to the environment, a lot of it's still in the environment because it's so difficult to break down. When it gets in our body, it has a half-life of about two years, two or more years. So it's really hard to get rid of this stuff. But how about things like PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls? They were banned just a few years after DDT. But the problem is they're even worse persistent organic pollutants. When they get in our human, human bodies, that half-lives range from two to 10 years. And there are some PCBs with half-lives of 25 years. Typically more chlorinated uh, hydrocarbon, the more difficult it is to break down. So we have some uh, PCBs that you get when eating farmed fish that once you get into the body, they're there pretty much the rest of a person's life because it takes four half-lives to get rid of a toxin. So if a toxin has a half-life of 25 years, once you get that toxin, it's pretty much done the rest of the life. Okay, so many of these toxins, yes, the numbers look low, but there are hundreds of these things in the environment and they're building up in our bodies and they're causing disease. And they're building up in our bodies because they're so difficult to break down. So just looking at DDT levels, look at people's age. As you can see, as people get older, their DDT levels go up, their PCB levels go up, et cetera. What's particularly interesting in that is when does most disease start showing up? It starts showing up right about here. What's happening right around the 40s and 50s? We now have accumulated enough of these toxins because we can't get rid of them, or they're very hard to get rid of, and they have now caused so much damage to the DNA and our biological systems that we're no longer is able to protect ourselves from the toxins and no longer is able to get rid of the toxins. So the numbers go up relentlessly and you see all these disease associations. And it's fascinating. If you look at disease associations between toxins and people below about the age of 30, you see some correlations that are there, particularly in some, some in children with ADHD and loss of IQ, things like that. But for the major diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancer and such, you don't see a lot of correlation. But once you get the 40s and 50s, then all the correlations start popping up. So some people might say, well, you only look for toxins if a person has the disease associated with that toxin. My perspective is, why wait for the disease to show up? We know that if you leave PCBs in people's bodies long enough, they will get diseases. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, okay? So you want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. So these chemicals bioaccumulate because they're so hard to get rid of and because the environment is so toxic. It's not just the chemicals, it's smells as well. Look at bioaccumulation of mercury. You'll get older, mercury levels go up. So we look at the, uh, at the um, priority list that's put out by the EPA through the various agencies, you look at which are the worst toxins. So I'm going to be talking today about five of what I consider the worst clinical toxins. But I want to be clear, I'm not talking about all the toxins, there's many more, but I picked these five because I think they're so important, so bad, 
they're diagnosable and they're treatable. Number one is arsenic. I, now, I'm, I'm quite aware of this because I've been looking at a lot of research lately, but 10 years ago when I first started really deeply diving into environmental medicine, arsenic did not occur to me as being a toxin. But I started seeing study after study showing, well, wait a minute, my correlation between arsenic and this disease and the other disease, then I found this uh, database from the government. And the government says, yeah, arsenic is number one. Most people are aware of lettuce, lettuce being important, mercury. So we're talking about these three, cause a lot of disease. Vinyl chloride, primarily in uh, industrial exposure. Polychlorinated by phenols, hugely problematic, standing by for a long time. And then I'm going to be talking about um, the bisphenols. Now, they're not on the EPA list. I think that's a big mistake by the EPA. I think you'll see why in, in a moment. So you may be wondering, well, where's all this data coming from? Well, the good news is that the U.S., way better than the nearest I can tell any other country in the world, we've been measuring by load of toxins in our society for many years. So we have a very good idea about what levels are and how they've been changing. All comes from this book. And while this, it's titled 2019, the fourth national report, um, they actually update about every six months. So the data tables I'm going to show you, actually from the later versions of this particular document, was considered 2019 version whatever. Okay. So now let's go into it. Let's go into what are the five worst toxins. I'm going to cover metals first alphabetically, then I'm going to cover um, chemicals. Again, arguments can be made that there are other toxins that are worst, argument cannot be made that arsenic is not the worst. Arsenic is a stunningly common problem in our society. So we start looking at, well, where does arsenic come from? Well, a big portion of the arsenic comes from water supplies. And it turns out these are public water supplies in the United States. And when the USGS looked at the amount of arsenic in the public water supplies, they used as a threshold 10 micrograms per liter. So if you look at the research, the research says anything about 10 micrograms per liter uh, is associated with uh, human disease. Now the numbers, it actually should be a little lower than that, and I'll, I'll show you why in a moment. But just using the, the uh, official numbers, so you're looking at uh, public, uh, public water supplies, as you can see, there are a lot of public water supplies that are either clearly into the dangerous area or um, are close to the dangerous area which can be dependent upon person's genetic susceptibility and nutritional status. But here's the kicker. Only 50% of the public water supplies have reported their arsenic levels to the USGS. Well, why is that? This is a $50 test. Why has, hasn't every water supply reported their arsenic levels? And I would guess it's because they don't want people to know what the numbers are. Lots, lots of contamination. Okay, then you look at private wells. Lots, lots of contamination in private wells, particularly in the New England area. And in Maine, well, we know that the threshold for uh, arsenic toxicity is 10 micrograms per liter of, of drinking water. Some of the wells in Maine have 3,000 uh, milligrams of arsenic in the water supply, or uh, micrograms, 3,000 micrograms to 3 milligrams per liter of arsenic in the water supply, results in huge amounts of disease. So what diseases do we see? How about diabetes? So now when you're measuring arsenic levels in people, realize that arsenic has a very short half-life. In the average person, half-life of arsenic is only two to four days, which tells me that as we evolve as a species, we're exposed to arsenic, so we develop good ways to get rid of it. Okay. The problem is we're being exposed to way too much arsenic. So what's arsenic do? There's a number of mechanisms, but the main one is it binds to, it blocks uh, pancreatic secretion of insulin. And the reason why you want to use toenail arsenic is because it gives you the average of arsenic exposure over a period of time. Since it only has a half-life of two to four days, if you happen to take the person's uh, urine during the period when they've been away from arsenic for a while, you might miss it. Okay, here we go, diabetes. But here's the kicker, cancer. So this is a study done in uh, Native Americans uh, now, it is possible Native Americans have some genetic polymorphisms that make them more susceptible to arsenic toxicity. I've not seen any research that documents that, but it, it might be that I just haven't, haven't found it. But they're looking at arsenic in cancers. Look at, first off, overall cancer rate, and as arsenic levels go up, so does overall cancer. But then look at lung cancer, liver cancer, 
prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. And according to these researchers, arsenic accounts for one quarter to one third of all the major cancers, with one exception, and that is in the blood-borne cancers. So for some reason, lymphatic cancers, leukemia, et cetera, they are um, actually protected against by arsenic. And I, I was asking at a lecture I gave a few years ago, anybody know any, any idea why arsenic would protect against leukemia? And happily, one of the people in the audience had the answer. I was able to look it up and validate it. So it turns out that much of leukemia is due to benzene exposure. You may recall benzene was on the top 10 list of toxins according to CDC, or the EPA rather. So anyway, um, so it turns out benzene plays a huge role in causing these lymphatic and blood-borne cancers. Well, it turns out arsenic poisons the enzyme that converts benzene into the carcinogen, kind of backdoor benefit from arsenic. Okay, then we start looking at arsenic and other conditions. This one was done in Italy, and this was a huge study. It was a 20,000 person, 20 year prospective studies. Now, I don't know about you, but I love prospective studies. Because they, they um, prevent cherry picking of data. You basically say, I think I know what the problem is. Let's follow people over time and see what happens. So you then start looking at the amount of arsenic uh, from, uh, in the water supply and looking at, um, if this is a province in Italy, and they looked at effect on men, effect on females. They looked, what's arsenic do? Here's your threshold, 10 micrograms per liter of water. All right, this is two per liter of urine in this particular situation. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, this is drinking water. Okay, natural causes, 27% uh, uh, increase in risk for death. 10 and above 20 is 51 percent increased risk for death, minor coronary infarction, human heart disease, lung cancer, coronary atherosclerosis, COPD, women, same kinds of same kinds of problems, all those turn correlation with diabetes. So when we then look at our state, there's these great tables from that uh, uh, document I just showed you, which then looks at um, a total urinary arsenic over a period of time and looks at how it's changed. So you can look at this and look at uh, how it's, what the threshold is for toxicity. Remember I told you it's 10 micrograms per liter? Well, look at this. 35% of the population is above that threshold, which makes that data on cancer not so surprising. It's just so common. Then you look at what's happened over time, and our arsenic levels are getting worse. Interestingly enough, one of the reasons for that is because of people going on gluten-free diets where they start using more rice. It turns out the primary sources of arsenic in North America are drinking water, chicken, and rice. Okay, so this is actually getting worse. And one of the interesting, interesting things about arsenic is that they have various forms with hugely different toxicity. So if you just look at plain old arsenic, which we typically see, just looking at its level of, of um, the LD50, you're looking at real severe toxicity. Then you look at what the body does to break it down. The body basically breaks it down through a two-step process. The first step is here, it breaks it down into MMA, or monomethyl arsenic, arson, arsenic acid, if I'm not saying it quite right, okay? Or methyl uh, arsenic acid. This is actually more toxic Four to, four to eight times more to toxic than elemental, ar um, than elemental arsenic. So what our body then does, so this is basically one methylation of the arsenic. Then our body does a second methylation to create DMA, which is dimethyl arsenic, arsenic acid. And that is, you see here, about 100 times less toxic than metallic uh, arsenic. So basically it makes it a little toxicity. And we do have arsenic in seafood, but it's arsenobetaine and it has very, very low toxicity. So the fascinating thing about this is genetic polymorphisms and how fast people do the first methylation of arsenic and how fast they do the second methylation of arsenic. So here, way more toxic. Here, way, way, way less toxic. Some people overproduce MMA and get stuck there and they don't produce as much DMA and they're the ones that get way more toxic from arsenic. And it turns out people with these polymorphisms are not that uncommon and 1% of the population has both 
a very active form of production of MMA and very slow version of DMA. And that 1% is way more toxic to arsenic than is the general population. So let's look at this a little more closely. Um, another factor that's important is glutathione, because in order to get arsenic into the proper form for detoxification, it has to be, has to be uh, converted into the right um, electron version of the, of the arsenic, and glutathione does that. So it turns out that when people are depleted in glutathione, they produce more of the toxic version of arsenic because they can't detoxify it properly. Okay, so now one thing that we did was I got through with my team, and as I was looking at the surprising amount of research showing that people with high levels of a particular toxin that would increase incidence of a particular chronic disease, I hired a couple of really bright bastard grads to work with me to answer the question, what percent of specific chronic diseases are due to specific toxins? So public health has actually looked at this in other areas, particularly on cigarette smoking, trying to answer the question, uh, what percent of lung cancer is due to cigarette smoking? And they use this formulation. This is from public health. You can dive into more deeply if you want to. But it's much easier to look at it this way graphically. So let's take a group of 400 people. And of these 400 people, 300 are non-smokers, 300 here, and 100 are smokers. So 25% are smoking. Now the non-smokers, 5% of them, or 15 or 300 people, will get lung cancer to, due to factors other than cigarette smoking. Now cigarette smokers double the risk of lung cancer. Now, of course, the more they smoke, the bigger that, that risk is going to be. Nutritional efficiencies, genetic susceptibility, et cetera, et cetera. But just as an average, it's, it's just, just take twice. So here we have 100 people, five got lung cancer for factors other than cigarette smoking, five got lung cancer due to cigarette smoking, so this five additional from cigarette smoking, you divide that by the total of 25 people who had this lung cancer, turns out 20% of lung cancer is due to cigarette smoking. We applied exactly that same formula to a wide, a large number of environmental toxins and chronic diseases. The numbers we found were stunning. And the good news is that other researchers are starting to do this as well. Okay, so let's look at arsenic. Arsenic number one looking at what disease, what's the threshold for that particular disease for getting significant increased risk for disease. We look at the percent above the threshold uh, for this particular one. And by the way, you'll notice some inconsistencies from these numbers because every, researchers tend to parse the data differently. And so uh, I, well, you might say, well, wait, your numbers are inconsistent. Well, that's research, okay? Some researchers are going to find is going to look at one particular population, see something. Another group of researchers will look at a different population, see something somewhat different. So you have to kind of average them all off together. So what percent above the threshold? For those above the threshold, how much does increase the risk? We then dump it into that formula I just showed you, and up comes the percent of disease due to that toxin. And here's an example PMID. Now we want to be very clear. It takes multiple research studies to be able to come up with these numbers. I just gave it an example so you can see where this is coming from. But look at this, gout. I don't know about you, but I was, when I was in naturopathic medical school, I, didn't, I wasn't taught 52% of gout is due to arsenic. You go to any standard conventional medical textbook right now, not in there. Except my textbook in natural medicine, it's in there, okay? I don't know why, but conventional medicine has been blind to how much disease is due to these environmental toxins. Then we look at the cancers. A third of prostate cancer, a quarter of pancreatic cancer, 18% of diabetes, 14% of bladder cancer. Arsenic is huge. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay. But now, how do you assess people's arsenic stacks? Now, arsenic is going to be a little more complex than the other ones uh, because there's some pretty significant genetic and nutritional factors. So my own perspective is uh, you want a person to have less than seven micrograms of arsenic. It can be per gram of creatinine, or it can be a per liter. They're fairly close. I know it's not exactly the same, but it's actually pretty close. Okay. Now, if they're not in their normal environment, you can look at their toenails, and then greater than 0 0.5 micrograms per gram of toenail uh, is going to be the problem. My preference is urinary because it's easy to measure, and um, you can then see changes quickly. Whereas you depend upon toenails, it can take months before you see a change in the toenail. Now, arsenic is a little more complex. 
So you have to kind of look at it in the bigger picture. So we know, for example, that anybody with arsenic uh, in their, in their you know, water supply greater than 20 micrograms per liter, first everybody's going to get disease. Okay. 20% um, of the U.S. population is above this threshold. Then you start looking at the um, arsenic levels uh, between 11 and 19 micrograms per liter. So in general, the people who get disease are those who have genetic susceptibility. So for example, one of the SNPs will result in them overproducing MMA so that DMA production can't keep up with them. Or it could be that they're uh, producing DMA at a re MMA at a reasonable level, but their DMA conversion is really slow. So we don't know which one it is. But with either one of those, which is 20% of the population, okay, they're going to be much, much more toxic to this level of, of arsenic. Now, supposedly in the safe range below 10, well, if they got both SNPs, people that 1% with both SNPs, they're going to get disease. But how about people over here? It doesn't matter about genetics, levels not very high. But what if they're deficient in folic acid? So that methylation of the arsenic doesn't happen if there's not a folic acid around. So this is a great example of the difference, difference between the more natural medicine approach, which is kind of nurturing, give people the needed nutrients, to where you've got to intervene. Person has 20 micrograms of, of arsenic per liter of water. I, it doesn't doesn't matter um, how much folic acid you give them. If it's too much, it's gonna be, they're going to be toxic. You got to intervene. You got to get the arsenic out of the water. So clinical application. This basically summarizes everything I just said. Basically, high arsenic levels. Everybody above 20. Everybody's got to be dealt dealt with. Well, my own per particular perspective is anybody above seven you should deal with their arsenic levels. Uh, now, if you want to check their genetics, fine, uh, they can have higher exposure, but why? Let's keep everybody as low as possible. Which means you also need to look at, well, if a person is being exposed to arsenic, maybe levels aren't that high, but how do you determine if they're not, if they're having trouble detoxifying the arsenic? How about they have high levels of homocysteine? You do detoxify arsenic by methylation. Well, if people have high levels of homocysteine, means they don't have much in the way of available methyl groups, which means they're more, more, can be more toxic to arsenic. Got to make sure everybody has glutathione support. So, for example, you have somebody who's um, being exposed to arsenic in the water supply. It's not terrible, say, say 10, but they're a heavy drinker. Well, what happens with heavy drinking? They deplete glutathione. Of course, they're going to be more susceptible to arsenic toxicity. Okay. Now, I also believe if the water is above around five, for sure around seven, got to the water. Okay, lead. I think everybody's quite aware lead is a huge problem, and we as a society have done a good job of decreasing lead levels. But even though we've been decreasing lead levels, there's still a huge contribution to disease. So I saw this study, just published in 2018. Okay, so this is not like this is 50 years ago when arsenic levels were super high. This is now. They're looking at arsenic causing 18% of all cause mortality, and then around one third of death from cardiovascular disease. As you can see, all cause mortality goes up as blood levels go up, and so does the uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, death go up with, with lead, huge. So we went through that, um, those formulas I talked to you about, looking at various factors around lead, looking at ischemic disease from cardi cardiac failure, cardiac death, uh, well, it turns out 20% of people are above the threshold of five micrograms per deciliter. By the way, the, C, the um, EPA level for uh, lead is 10 micrograms per deciliter for adults and five micrograms per deciliter for children. There's no safe level of lead, as you'll see very quickly in this next line. But just sticking with the um, ischemic death, look at this, above 20% 20, uh, 20 above the threshold, we have a six-fold increased risk for death from a, from a heart attack, accounting for about over a third of heart attacks. Here's an example. Infertility in males detected as low as 0 0.8 micrograms of lead per deciliter of urine, or of blood, okay? One third of the population above this threshold decreases male fertility by 27%. All-cause mortality, 18%. Amyotrophic lateral six percent, ADHD two percent, and juvenile IQ. Children with a with a uh, le blood level of five of uh, ten micrograms per deciliter of blood compared to children with five have a five point lower IQ just from lead. So how are we doing this population with lead? Okay, here's our threshold. 
look at that, 80% of the population is above the threshold for things like male infertility. And what's happening? Well, the good news is that our body load of lead is going down. Taking lead out of gasoline and all these other things we've been doing uh, since the 70s, good, you know, good, good job. We definitely got the lead down. But we're still getting lead. Where? Where's it coming from? Water, dust, maternal field exchange, lead containing dishes, and bone loss. So think about your patients, your men and women going through andropause and menopause. What typically happens? They lose bone. What's in bone? The vast majority of the body stores of lead are in bone. So when people lose bone, their body load, their blood levels of lead go up. Okay. So one of the things to consider when people are getting older and start losing bone, you've got to check them not just for lead, but it turns out there's mercury in the bones as well. So assessment, blood, looks to me like blood levels are pretty good assessment. So you want children to be less than five micrograms per deciliter of blood, you want adults to be lower than five. I want to be very clear again, there's no safe level of lead. Okay, now don't go crazy and get lead out of people, but anything you can do to decrease your lead level is worth doing. So clinical application, maintain bone. For your older patients, that could be a really important factor. If the home was built or the water supply to the house was installed before 1987, you've got to test the water in the home. Because if that stuff is corroding, the water pH is not is not low, uh, is a little too low, or if there's corrosive molecules in the water supply, it will dissolve the lead in the joints, um, in, the, in the leaded joints. So make sure there's no lead in the uh, water supply. <clears throat> Supplements calcium directly competes with a lead. Uh, vitamin C it does a good job of um, helping get lead out of the body. And if cell cysteine helps get rid because the production of glutathione helps get rid of lead. But if people have high blood levels and symptoms uh, they think are correlated with their lead, you need to get out more quickly. So you can do EDTA, both oral and IV, physician protocol for that, or use DMSA. In oral, 250 milligrams every third day, you will get the lead out. Now, this is slow. Um, I've used this on patients, and you can decrease the lead supply by about 50% after a year and a half of doing uh, this particular protocol. Now, our final metal to look at is mercury. We have a huge problem with mercury release into the environment coming primarily from burning coal for energy or for production of cement. I know a lot of people are into uh, uh, global warming because of CO2 emissions from coal burning. And while um, I, I'm not as big into the climate stuff as other people are, what I am big into is CO2 is eaten by plants. Mercury is forever. Mercury poisons everything. So we're looking at these coal burning plants, while a lot of attention is being placed on CO2, way more attention should be placed on the mercury because the mercury is causing a lot of damage. Okay, so you can see very clearly where what's the primary source of energy production here? Coal burning or electricity. Okay, so another source of mercury is not just the air, it's from fish. And it turns out the more pe fish people eat, the higher the mercury levels. And unfortunately, um, it, um, although fish is high omega-3 fatty acids, that's not enough to mitigate the damaging effects from the mercury. Now, this study did not differentiate, these studies did not differentiate between the size of fish being eaten, which is unfortunate. They just looked at the total number of fish meals. But as I can see, as fish meals go up, so does mercury. And one study then looked at uh, psychomotor uh, parameters and showed that as mercury levels went up, both in the blood and in the urine, psychomotor dysfunction increased as well. And this was kind of encouraging in that it showed that the urine is was a good predictor of damage from mercury. So the mercury in fish varies hugely. If you look at mercury in this fish, by the way, all fish have mercury. If you look at the mercury in this fish versus mercury in this fish, a thousand times higher here than here. So you wanna make sure that people only eat fish in this category, never ever eat fish in this category. Now the source of mercury is silver fillings. So amalgams are actually more mercury than anything else. Typical Amalgam fillings by 55% mercury. The good news is the dental association, the profession, has finally started decreasing putting mercury into people's mouths. 
The bad news is that people's mouths are full of mercury, particularly older people. Now, one of the reasons that the dental profession was so slow in abandoning mercury is that the research that was done on fillings and mercury was designed in such a way, I'm being a little pejorative here, it looks to me like it was designed in such a way to cover up the effects of what they're looking for. And here's the issue. If you look at a person's mouth, look at a person's mouth and look at the amount of fillings in their mouth or number of fillings in their mouth, you'll see some teeth have a single filling, whereas other teeth, the tall top of the, of the tooth is covered with mercury because there's so many fillings. Okay, so when they're doing the research to obfuscate the results, you just count the number of teeth with fillings. So one tiny little filling versus the whole top of the tooth being covered with mercury, count them the same. Well, what happens? You end up with a huge error range that covers up the data. What if instead you look at the surface area of mercury in the mouth, now you start getting really strong correlations. So here's an example, looking at surface area in the mouth or something we as clinicians can do, simply count the number of fillings. And look at, if a filling comes all top of the tooth, I, I count it the same as six fillings. I don't have anything objective about that, that's just my estimate. We start doing that way, what you start doing is looking at things like, well, how about the amount of mercury in the brain? Direct correlation from cadavers, the more fillings in the mouth, the more mercury in the brain, and mercury is a terrible neurotoxin. Well, how about, you might say, well, cadavers, maybe the mercury just might migrate in there. Well, how about looking at life tissue? So this study was done, I think it was done from the Scandinavian countries. They were looking at kidneys that are donated for transplant. What they did was they basically did a biopsy of the kidney, see how much mercury was in. And what they found was that every filling in the mouth resulted in 6% more mercury in the kidneys. And they determined that of the mercury in the kidneys, the R factor was 0.62. So the best predictor of the amount of mercury in the kidneys was the number of fillings in a person's mouth. Now this one, so this, as you can see, very, very clear correlations. More mercury, in the, more fillings, more mercury everywhere in the body. Okay. Another thing I consider, however, are natural health products, tangible medicines. So one of the worst, worst polluted countries in the world with mercury is China. And why is that? Because China primarily uses coal burning for the production of energy. So it's contaminated, which means Chinese herbs are often contaminated. So here's a study um, from my uh, Dr. Stephen Morale to this uh, in Melbourne, Australia, that patient with high levels of mercury, he couldn't figure out why he had high, high levels of mercury and finally determined that a changeable medicine product he was taking had 1.2 micrograms per gram of product. That's 1.2 milligrams per gram of product. So taking the standard dosage every day was equivalent of eating tuna every day. But if you didn't think that's bad, well, how about, oops, I got this out of order. How about Ayurvedic herbals? I'm sorry, I got this covered. That's interesting. Um, there's a little inconsistency between my, my monitors here. Well, this is looking at an Ayurvedic herbal medicine, and it had at least five milligrams per gram of product. It saturated the equipment, so we couldn't determine how much was in it. Now, mercury is sometimes intentionally added to Ayurvedic herbal medicines. You just got to make sure you're using Ayurvedic herbal medicines, and there are a lot of great Ayurvedic herbal medicines. Make sure they're not contaminated. So one key reason why mercury is so high in Chinese herbal medicines, because there's so much release of mercury into the environment. Right now, greater than 50% of the release of mercury into the environment comes from China. Okay, can we start looking at mercury and disease? Well, next time you see a patient with Hashimoto's, check them for mercury. Okay. Now, I know mercury is a big problem. My research team, we basically just ran out of funding. I was not able to get all the data I wanted on mercury but I've been quite impressed by what I've seen so far. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. So how are we doing with mercury? Well, it turns out by 50% of the population has levels of mercury known to be associated with disease. And unfortunately, our mercury levels on average are going up. Looking at the geometric average, looking at 2004 versus 2010, yeah, actually it just fluctuates a bit. But the bottom line is uh, at worst, we're not doing better. Uh, actually, at best, we're not doing any better. At worst, we're doing worse. 
So how do you detect mercury? So first off, if you're looking for symptoms, mercury is one of those toxins that actually symptoms show up first. Okay, they show pretty pretty quickly. So and they're primarily neurological. Uh, you look at blood and urine, and the blood and urine will tell you what the current exposure is. It's not very good at determ determining actual body load. You can use hair mercury, but it's primarily looking at methyl mercury. It's not as good at looking at total body load of mercury. Okay, clinical application. If they got symptoms and amalgams, particularly if they have gold caps over amalgams or blue lines on their gums. So what happens when you put a gold cap over a mercury amalgam? While it's cheaper for the person and the, and it'll be covered up, the gold will cover up the mercury so you don't see it. It's making a little battery there and it's causing the mercury to dissolve more quickly. You'll see some patients. I mean, I've seen this. You see some patients look at the mouth, see a gold a gold cap. They look at the gum. Whoa. There's a blue line on the gum. The blue line is mercury. Okay. So you see that in a patient, you've got a big mercury problem. Okay. So I recommend that everybody remove all the mercury amalgams from their mouths, and it must be done by an ecological dentist. And why is that? Because you go to a regular dentist who does the typical drilling out of the mercury, it vaporizes the mercury, it goes right into the brain. I found one study that looked at mercury levels in the blood after a filling was removed, mercury levels of blood went up 50% and it took, here, here this, it took 18 months before it went back to where it was. So drilling out fillings is a really bad idea. So that's why you want to go to ecological dentists because they use a lot of methodologies to greatly decrease the release of the mercury when the amalgams are removed. I think fish is a healthy food for people, but eat only low mercury fish. And then we want to facilitate the body's ability to excrete. Now, we're pretty good at getting rid of mercury. Half-life is about 30 days. I'm sorry, half-life half is about 90 days. So we're fairly good at getting rid of it. But we've also sabotaged our mechanisms for getting rid of mercury. So our bodies are pretty good at getting rid of mercury. We uh, dump through the, um, through the bile, bile duct about 1% of the body load of mercury every day into the gut to be gotten rid of. But we then reabsorb 99.5% of that mercury through intrapathic recirculation. So why would our bodies go through all the stuff to get rid of mercury and then just reabsorb it? Because we've got enough fiber in our diets. As evolved as a species, as our body developed these various mechanisms for determining, uh, you know, for, for developing our detoxification mechanisms, well, it was based on what we were consuming at the time, what we were putting in our bodies. We put a lot of fiber into our bodies, 100, 150 grams a day. So our body says, oh, great, just get rid of the mercury through the liver, binds the fiber, gets out. Well, you're only consuming 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. You've sabotaged the, the, that particular mechanism. So a key thing we can do, and by the way, you have patients who are so sensitive that anything you do to them, they always get sicker. Give them vitamin, they get sicker. You try to do detox, they get sicker. Well, try just increasing their fiber. Because by increasing our fiber, we're supporting the normal mechanisms and we're not stirring things up. Okay. So at least 10 grams of fiber a day. You can get to 50, that's good, but don't do it all the way. You got to build people up at it. Okay. NAC is great. NAC increases the production of glutathione. That plays a huge role in protecting us from mercury and detoxifying mercury. Also, it directly binds to methylmercury. So you have a patient eat a lot of fish, NAC is going to be their friend because it'll bind to the methylmercury. You want to make sure you use trace minerals. And also, I then use DMSA oral 250 milligrams three times a day. So again, it's a very slow protocol. I have one patient who had high levels of mercury. I was able to get her mercury levels down about 90% after a year and a half with 250 milligrams with this protocol. I'm showing you right here. Okay. And also, some research showing that give people procurement um, it helps protect against the damage from the mercury. Now, I'll start looking at some of the chemicals. Let's look at the bisphenols. Now, notice I'm saying bisphenols. I'm not just saying bisphenol A. Because what's happening is, as the public has become uh, worried about bisphenol A, and we now have bisphenol A free plastics. Well, unfortunately, what do they do? They replace it with other bisphenols, which are actually, some of which are actually more toxic. But here's some interesting history. Bisphenol A and DES were both initially being researched in the 1930s as synthetic estrogens. And it turns out DES1, and it was then prescribed to pregnant women. 
I think we're aware that DES became hugely problematic because it was given to pregnant women for nausea pregnancy, but it caused their children to have urogenital cancers. And this is one of those examples where, while I look at a lot of research, sometimes it becomes very, very um, close to home. It becomes close to home because my college sweetheart mother took DES for her during her pregnancies. And my girlfriend from college died from breast cancer. Her younger sister, whom her mother took DES for during pregnancy, died from urine cancer. And her younger brother, the last child in the family, died from prostate cancer in his early 40s. And his mother took DES. So this one's very real to me, folks. So here we have DES pulled from the market because it caused all these problems. And look at this molecule, very, very similar. We've now put it into the food supply and we filled her up with all this stuff. And because BPA was starting to show problems, we just, just substituted another bisphenol, okay? Hugely, hugely problematic. So I started looking at some diseases. So I started looking at um, PubMed and bisphenols and diabetes. And all of a sudden, a bunch of research is popping up. And not only that, but then looking at the other bisphenols and looking at the risk for diabetes, look at this. Although bisphenol A in terms of diabetes risk was, is not a really strong risk, look at this BPAF, one of the ones that's being substituted. It's worse for diabetes. But still, bisphenol A is a problem. Bisphenol A is an obesogen. As body levels of bisphenol A go up, so it does obesity. And where does bisphenol A come from? More packaging materials. You store canned soup in cans, you get a dramatic increase in bisphenol A. Store soy milk in cans, dramatic increase in bisphenol A. And it turns out that just one serving a week of soy milk in cans or two servings a week of canned soup is enough to double a person's risk for diabetes. Problematic. And the alternatives are not safer. Here's all these alternatives that are being used, very similar dis uh, endocrine dis disruptors. And while they're technically speaking, non persistent toxins because they have short half lives, the half lives are measured in hours today, so they're easy to get rid of. The problem is they're considered semi persistent because we're being inundated with this, these things all the time. If you have this misfortune of ending up in the hospital, which happened to me once because I got this huge infection on my arm. So, I won't get into it right now. Sometimes you do need antibiotics. Anyway, um, I was in a hospitalized for the huge infection I got because I put my arm open. And um, I started looking around. This feeling is coming to my body from the plastic tubing. This feeling is coming from my body from these plastic cups to give me to eat from. This feeling is coming from my body from, you just look at the whole environment. So, bisphenol A. The good news is bisphenol A levels have gone down from 2.58, uh, where's my criteria measured here? Uh, urinary uh, micrograms per gram creatinine. It went down. Isn't that nice? But look what's gone up. The other bisphenol A's are going up. Okay. And they weren't there before. Okay, now how about bisphenol S and male infertility? Well, it turns out that overweight men, which is the majority of the population, Bisphenol A directly correlates with loss of male fertility. The good news is that the half-lives of bisphenols are, are pretty short. The bad news is that we're constantly being exposed to them. I'm not getting into detail about how we detoxify them. Okay. Now let's look into the, uh, okay, I'm getting a little tight here. I'm now looking at the data on bisphenol A's and disease. So that's okay. Uh, bisphenol A's, uh, diabetes is a factor. These other ones we could not we could not get to the completion of um, the research on these. We got some we got part way through and ran out of the money. But what we did find what's interesting, in particular this one. Look at infertility. So this is looking at micrograms um, per mL or I said, picograms per mL of urine. Looking at these various factors, and what are we seeing? As bisphenol A levels in the testes goes up, we go from normal sperm to low sperm, to abnormal sperm, to no sperm whatsoever. You wonder by why we're having an infertility epidemic? Okay. 
Okay, so how do you assess it? Very straightforward. Um, my preference is that you look at total bisphenols. Unfortunately, all we have right now is urinary bisphenols. Um, hopefully, we'll get um, testing with that one. Clinical complication, this one's simple. Avoid all the bisphenols, but it gets rid of it pretty quickly. Now, if you can't get rid of it entirely, antioxidants help protect. And now we've got the PCBs, which are terrible because they're very, very persistent toxins. Where they come from? From the environment, but especially from farm fish. And why? And if you look at uh, farm fish versus wild caught, look at this farm fish from Ireland. Huge amounts of PCBs. Even the wild caught salmon has huge amounts of PCBs because they are feeding the farm fish food that's contaminated with PCBs. If we look at Canada and US, wild fish, very low PCBs, farm fish, PCBs, same as like wild salmon from, from Ireland. Scotland uh, has some somewhat similar problems to Ireland in terms of the wild fish, but they're better with their farm, farm salmon. Okay, so why do does farm fish have high levels of PCBs? Because it's in the fish food. And then we get fish oil, from these fish, the fish oil is full of PCBs. Now, I know people used to be concerned about uh, oxidized, um, uh, uh, some people are concerned about oxidized uh, fatty acids in fish oils. Some people are concerned about mercury in fish oils. Well, folks, I can tell you for sure, virtually no mercury in fish oils. I know because I tested it, did a bunch of samples. Uh, but what I do know is that these fish oils, unless they're distilled and very, very clean, they're full of this stuff. Not good for us. How about various diseases um, with PCBs? Well, let's look at cardiovascular disease in women. Turns out there's huge increases in risk of cardiovascular disease in women because of PCBs. Look at these numbers. Are you aware of any other factor where there are 13 fold increased risk for cardiovascular disease? This is way worse than, than cholesterol. Then we start looking at the various diseases, looking at how about infertility in women? This is looking at women in Scandinavia, comparing those who ate fish from the Baltic Ocean, which has an inland ocean or in the sea, is way more uh, contaminated than the Atlantic Ocean. That's the only differentiation, where they got their fish from. It turns out eating Baltic Ocean fish increased their uh, risk of uh, infertility by a factor 2.5 and decrease in their fertility, as you can see, cause infertility in men. Diabetes about a quarter of diabetes appears to be due to PCBs. Why is that? PCBs bind to insulin receptor sites so that the body, the pancreas has to overproduce insulin to get sugar into the cells. <clears throat> One quarter of myocardial infarctions. So rather than just test your patients for cholesterol, check your PCBs, folks, because these PCBs are hugely predictive of cardiovascular disease. Rheumatoid arthritis, a quarter of rheumatoid arthritis in women due to PCBs, ADHD. Now I put it in gray, the bottom one here, because the numbers are just too big. Uh, there, I think there are too many confounding factors. I'm having trouble believing that the primary cause of breast cancer is PCBs. By the way, something's kind of interesting. You know what the best way is to get PCBs out of a woman? Have her breastfeed. You know about the implications of that. Okay, so safe way of doing it. How about giving people a uh, clostamide? So it turns out the bile sequesterants, things like clostamide, cholesterol, and such, are very, very good at getting PCBs out of the body, as well as DTT and these other um, persistent organic pollutants. Okay. Going back to the breastfeeding, a woman can decrease her risk of breast cancer uh, by about a third for breastfeeding for a year. So good news is that getting the PCBs out of the woman. The bad news is the PCBs are going to the babies. But it could be one of the reasons why women who breastfeed more have less breast cancer because the breastfeeding is getting rid of the toxins. The assessment, so our best is going to be a fat biopsy, which of course is impractical. So what we typically do, we'll look at PCB levels in the blood and then correct it for lipid levels. As it turns out, as fat levels of the blood go up, there's more fat soluble toxins in the blood as well. So we want it to be able to get kind of apples to apples. We correct it for the amount of fat in the blood. 
but my own perspective is, isn't the total amount of blood what counts? <laughs> okay. So people have high levels of fat, not only is the fat bad for them, typically fat fats, but it's also more full of toxins. Okay, so clinical complication. Never eat farm fish, period. I say, well, I, I, I go out like once a month to a restaurant with my friends and have farm fish there. Well, fine, once a month. Farm fish has PCBs in them with half-life measured in years to decades. You can't get rid of the stuff. Don't do it. Fiber. The more fiber, the better. Saunas are great for uh, toxin elimination. And if you're not getting good results, you can use biosequesters. Okay, so now let's get to our kind of summary here of some key factors, and that is foundational strategies. Avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. Okay, there's no, I, I know people have become very excited about these various, uh, let's just up here, close it please, okay. Um, people get excited about all these detox programs, good idea, but if you're not stopping the toxins coming into your body, a real limited benefit from doing these detox programs. So avoidance, 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 never beach farm fish. Fiber, the more the better. Uh, I prefer rice bran fiber uh, rather than wheat bran fiber, almost any fiber. Sealing seed, uh, PGH, whatever it is, all these fibers can help get rid of the toxins. Saunas are incredibly effective. Saunas, the sweating gets rid of many toxins and often get rid of toxins that don't even show up in the blood or the urine because they're so bad to buy sequester and to get rid of as best as possible. I recommend people, I, I don't recommend a particular temperature. I recommend whatever temperature is necessary to get to, to get to sweat freely within 20 minutes. You want to sweat freely for at least 20 minutes, one to four, one to four times per week. Okay. And again, at the high levels, PCBs or other fat soluble uh, toxins, use biosequesters. Now, key factor when practicing this medicine is you must have patience. When we think about intervention, when we, you know, pri primarily be using drugs, we expect patients to respond to the drugs with the hours to days. We'll use herbal medicine, days to weeks. Use nutritional medicine, weeks to months. Doing detoxification medicine, while you will get quick response when you get rid of the, the low toxins, the non-persistent toxins, give responses within weeks, the bigger toxins, those heavy metals, those uh, persistent organic pollutants and such, take a long time to get rid of. So here's the situation. First, you have to identify and stop the exposure. Then you gotta get the bioloaded toxins down. Some are pretty quick, others hard to get, hard to get rid of. Then before the enzymes can work, they gotta be replaced because many of these toxins work by poisoning enzymes so that you, you, you keep, you, the enzyme's dead, you can't get rid of it. And it takes, you know, one to two to three months to replace enzymes. And then you can repair the damage. So typically environmental medicine takes months to years to work. We get results that are very, very deep. Okay. So in summary, toxins are ubiquitous in the industrialized world. Toxins have become the primary drivers of chronic disease. Five toxins account for most of the damage, but there are now about 100 metals and chemicals in the environment at high enough levels increased disease in people. Avoidance is critical, and the good news is that if we have many mechanisms within our natural medicine world that are very effective at decreasing people's bioloads of toxins. And a couple of resources for you. I wrote a book called The Toxin Solution for Consumers, which shows them how to avoid toxins, how to prepare their body to get rid of toxins, and how to get rid of toxins. Then for the doctors, uh, I co-authored with Dr. Walter Crinion, uh, my good friend who's now recently deceased, we wrote this textbook, Clinical Environmental Medicine, where we lay out all the things you can do. To, we lay out the full research on how toxins cause disease, where they come from, how you assess them, how the body gets rid of them, and how you can help body get rid of them. Thank you for your kind attention. And Kyla, I think uh, the ball's in your court now. Yes, great. Thank you for that. That. Uh was amazing, tons of information, a lot of questions coming through. So we'll see how many we can get through um, in the next time. Next stop, share, how do you want to do this next? Um, you can leave it up if you'd like, uh, yeah. if you, yeah, it's easy to yeah, just, this, this um, you know. yeah, and we can um, um, provide some links as well to these, uh, these resources in your book as well, and say the follow-up on the landing page. Right. 
But let's see um, where to start with some of these questions. So um, I actually think a question came through on, on your book, The Toxin Solutions. You have a regimen uh, of cleaning out the body organ by organ. Do you still yes. recommend that regimen? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. you know, one of my biggest yeah. with the people on detox programs is, well, a lot of these detox programs kind of steer toxins out. But our society is so, so toxic now, your gut doesn't detoxify properly, liver doesn't detoxify properly, kidneys are way overloaded. So you got to get these things cleaned up first before you start stirring up the tox toxins. Otherwise, you'll just make people sicker because you're just stirring things, you know, moving things around rather than getting rid of them. Yeah. Um, a question came in. Um, that's interesting. It's kind of like a, a longer one. Do you see any pesticide toxicity with chronic marijuana users? I have a client uh, who became very ill and had high levels of DDA in his urine. Our FM doc was able to detox him, but he was very, very ill. Great question and absolutely true. So here's the problem. Um, it's not as bad now as it was because more states have legalized marijuana, but marijuana, as you know, has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of public interest in it. And so when marijuana is grown indoors, it's an unnatural mm -hmm. environment. So they have to spray the marijuana with all these fungicides and pesticides, et cetera, and they get into the marijuana. And when you smoke the marijuana, it goes right into the body. There's no more efficient way to get toxins into the body than by smoking it. So people, I'm not, I'm not against marijuana. People want to do marijuana, it's fine. Um, but when you do marijuana, you want to make sure it's as clean as possible. So you want to make sure mm -hmm. it's organic grown marijuana. And I'd also say you probably want to do the, um, what they call the uh, cartridges, the uh, extracted marijuana. And the reason for that is that you look at lung cancer risk, marijuana leaf smoking is actually twice as bad as tobacco leaf smoking. Okay? Oh. So you don't, don't want to be smoking those leaves. Now, of course, you don't smoke marijuana as much as, as cigarettes, but anyway, they're bad. But also then um, when you look at have the least toxicity, THC as a pure chemical has very low toxicity. It's not the THC, it's all the other stuff that comes along. So I recommend to my patients who want to smoke marijuana, do the, do the, do the cartridges where you've got the extracted versions, do the CO2 extraction from organic marijuana. So that way, you not only don't have the pesticides, but also you don't have the solvents left over either, because solvents are really bad for people too. So again, yes, if you saw a patient with problems from smoking marijuana from uh, pesticides and other chemicals. I'm not all surprised. Super interesting. Um, I thought I was very interested to see that um, question. I, you know, I'm in Canada. We have a lot of everything is legal right now, so I'm interested to see the effect of that. You know, yes. um, yeah, a couple marijuana more. is interesting in that the um, I've been looking at the research on the cannabinoids. Although everybody's been kind of looking at THC, marijuana yeah. is full of a lot of other molecules, and wow a lot of incredibly important uh, physiological effects. But I think we're going to see marijuana as uh, THC-free marijuana as a therapeutic agent uh, pretty soon. Mm, interesting. Um, okay, a couple more kind of general ones that I thought came through. Um, this one's a two-part. What are the various ways that DNA can be repaired as a result of the chemical damages after they've been cleared from the body? And then speaking of so, clearing. Stop, stop. Wait, okay. one question okay. 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 Great question. I'm glad somebody brought that up. So one of the things I was wondering about was arsenic is a huge toxin. Why, why are people paying more attention to it? I mean, why is the conventional medicine paying more attention to it? It's causing so much disease. Then it occurred to me, gee, I wonder, could arsenic be more toxic now than it was 50 years ago when most of the attention was being placed on environmental toxins within conventional medicine. So I thought to myself, well, is there any way I can determine if arts became more toxic? Then I looked at cancer. And it turns out that, as we well know, that when DNA becomes damaged, not just the not just the nuclear DNA, but the mitochondrial DNA, finally more important, when it becomes damaged, we're, we're more susceptible to cancer. But we normally repair our nuclear DNA. But the enzyme that does the repair guess what? It's poisoned by arsenic, okay? So as arsenic levels have gone up, another thing has happened. So I have a new lecture entitled um, Unimportant Molecules Facetiously. What I did there was I've looked at 
what's happened to our modern food supply as we've gone to chemical farming. As we start growing our foods with chemicals rather than organically, we've lost a lot of molecules from the food supply. And they're lost from the food supply because they weren't considered important. They weren't vitamins or minerals. But it turns out they have other effects in the body that are important for health. One of those effects are there's a number of flavonoids in food that protect the body from arsenic. And we have lower levels of these flavonoids that protect the body from arsenic. Now we can protect ourselves from arsenic as well, which means we now have more arsenic damage to the DNA. And guess what? We got more cancer. Okay. Second part of the so thanks for asking the question. I want to be able to say that. <laughs> Okay, second part of the question. Yeah, no, I should have gone. I should have gone one at a time. So, and speaking of when clearing the body, what are the most common mistakes practitioners make when designing protocols for patients to clear chemicals from their bodies? Detoxifying before the organs of elimination are functioning properly. Nature, nature paths call these the mutters. You've got to have the detox system functioning first, and then you do detox. Now, it'll take a little more time for your patients. But the good news is that the protocols I described in, my, in the toxin solution, within two weeks, patients will notice some improvement in their health. The disease they have may not go away, but they'll start noticing some improvement. And as they start noticing some improvement, they'll be more willing to engage in long-term work that will produce some really good, deep results. It takes, it takes time to get done. All right, um, what else we have? Is magnesium replacement critical when dealing with toxic overload on which other minerals are also key? Or uh, are there? <laughs> very good question. Magnesium, first off, near as I can tell, magnesium is one of the most common mineral deficiencies, particularly in men. So magnesium is really important for people. But the other part is trace minerals. The way many of these toxins work is by replacing the trace minerals from the enzyme systems and putting the toxic metal instead. Well, when you have a diet deficient in trace minerals, the enzymes are more susceptible to being poisoned by the toxins at lower dosages because they're not being competed with by the trace minerals. So absolutely critically important to have plenty of trace minerals to complete with these toxins. Uh, I can do, let's see if we do a couple more in general. There's some questions on arsenic in general and testing, but... Um... Actually, one that just came through is, have you found a link with any particular toxins and migraines? You know, I would assume definitely, um, but off the top of my head, I haven't directly looked at that. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I not, I can't give a good answer. I, I need to look at that one. I'm yeah. Sure. I'm sure it's plain. I just, I, 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 only, I only want to tell you stuff about research, and I haven't researched that once. I don't know the answer. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so, a couple questions surrounding types of testing and what types of testing you recommend. So, which types or which testing for environmental toxins do you recommend? And what about lead or mercury if a patient cannot afford functional medicine testing? I know you probably touched on it a bit, but, um, you know, any. Any more details or, or repetition is probably good too if questions are being asked. <laughs> so the simplest thing you can do and the least expensive is to measure the patient's blood levels in GTT, also known as GTTP. So this is a liver enzyme, which in the past was measured to determine if people had hepatitis. Well, we now have some better measures, so it's not routinely screened anymore, even though it was routinely screened in the past. Nonetheless, it's available, it's just a cheap test to run. The reason it's useful to run is because GTT increases in proportion to oxidative stress and environmental toxic load. And why is that? Because our smart bodies increase the recycling of glutathione when people are exposed to environmental toxins. Direct correlation is the environmental toxin levels go up, mercury, PCBs, bisphenols, all kinds of stuff, GTT goes up as well, okay? Not only that, but GTT correlates with risk of death and a lot of diseases like diabetes, for example. So the normal range for GTT is 10 to 50. That depends on the lab, some are 10 to 60, but to say 10 to 50. Within the normal range, risk of diabetes increases in proportion to GTTP. A GTTP above 40, but below 60, 
is associated with a 20-fold increased risk of diabetes. A GTT from 30 to 60 is an eight-fold increased risk for diabetes. So the simplest thing you can do is screen your patients with GTT. And anybody got a GTT above about 20, maybe even lower, um, they're likely uh, toxic in some way. Then you can do the more expensive tests. Now, one clear caveat, about 10% of the population does not upregulate GTT in proportion to toxic load. These are typically your people who are the yellow canaries, the ones who are most easily toxic. And I have my own experience with this. I've, I've been following GTT now for over 10 years. And something that I've noticed is that I've been measuring my own GTT. So about 10 years ago, when I first learned about this, I measured my own GTT and it was 27. Now, normally you would think, well, that's pretty good. But as I become more and more aware of environmental medicine and I've worked to decrease my exposure to these things, my GTT went to, that from 27 to about 23, 23, five years ago. And then a couple months ago, I just did it again. I was down to 17. Mm -hmm. So that's taught me that as I've been working on this step-by-step -step, removing exposure to toxins, it's been great. My GTT has gone down. My health has gone up. That's, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I think actually a lot of questions came through on like specific things to do to get rid of the toxins. I know you probably, you definitely touched on some, but lots, when it comes to, ar there. yeah, arsenic in, and when you were talking about arsenic and, and water contamination, is there a specific way that you recommend to take or try to get arsenic out of the water? And do you just recommend drinking distilled water? And or so, do you recommend? There are, so if the arsenic levels are high, you must engage in strategies. And there are technologies that can be used <clears throat> to decrease levels of arsenic in the water supply. And one that's most commonly used is reverse osmosis. But there's now some uh, gel filtration methods that look like they're going to be effective. And I've just started to look at them, so I'm not able to answer. But right now, the best method we know is reverse osmosis, unfortunately. And I guess when it comes to rice, we've got a few questions asking, do you have you know, a brand of rice that is the safest to con consume? Um, or some that are, is like, I've read that basmati rice is lowest in the arsenic and brown rice is highest. Is it safer to eat certain types of rice more often? <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of questions on rice. <laughs> for, for good reason. Yeah. Um, the bad news is that it doesn't appear to matter whether it's organic grown or conventionally grown. What matters with rice is, is there arsenic in the water supply because rice use a lot of uh, use a lot of water. Also, mm -hmm. if rice is being fertilized with chicken manure, you have to make sure those chickens were not fed arsenic, which up until recently was standard of care for chickens to feed them arsenic for, for, various, for various reasons. The only way to determine the arsenic, if the rice is safe is to have the manufacturer of the rice provide for you written documentation that they've had it tested. And I've not gotten much positive response from any manufacturer I've asked that question of. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, interesting, I know there's even a question on, is organic free range chicken free of arsenic, which you answered as well. Yeah, it, 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 it ought to yeah. be lower, but if it's free range uh, in an area that had been used a lot of arsenic for the chickens, well, the arsenic's in the soil. The only way to determine is by actually measuring. Um, and a question too, when it comes to a couple around you, when you were talking about the heavy metal test, do you recommend um, the urine a heavy metal test? Is it the best way to assess the body's burden for heavy metals? Would that be a recommendation you would always so, kind of start with? So we're getting into more uh, in-depth work. So I do believe in both blood and urine for testing for metals, which are, which are pretty good for acute exposure. They're not very good about telling, telling body load. So if we want to look at body load, we then use uh, 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 challenge testing, highly controversial, but is a little more accurate. You know, that's topic for more in-depth discussion another time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a, definitely a, a bunch coming in. I know we, I think we touched on a kind of the main themes. If there's more that come into, um, you know, webinars at fullscript.com connects with us, we can potentially pass them along. Um, we'll share some resources to that, hopefully answer the questions, maybe rewatching the recording will help answer the questions too. Um, we're conscious of everyone's time and your time, Dr. Pizorno too. So thank you, thank you. 
Um, so much for, for being here today. That was an amazing presentation, so much information and such great feedback from attendees. So we will get everyone and all registrants the recording as soon as we can and the resources again. And um, we will hope to have you back with us soon, Dr. Pizzorno. Great, thank you all. All, all right. right, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.